This time I'd like to introduce our speaker and also welcome him to West Virginia. Hunter Hack Hackworth uh, was a native of Oklahoma where his father served as a minister in the Fort Gibson Church of Christ. He is uh, uh, a graduate of Harding, uh, and he has uh, graduated there in 2017, and he's been preaching uh, at the Southwestern Church of Christ in Grove City, Ohio. He has been married uh, for three years to Hannah, and uh, he they both share their love for the ministry of the church. Today he's going to bring us a lesson from Psalm 146, uh, God blesses those who trust in him. It is a blessing to trust, to have confidence in consistency, to have assurance in the unchanging. It is a blessing to trust, to rely on ever-present realities, to have certitude in integrity. It is a blessing to trust, to depend on greater authorities, to be established in credibility. It is a blessing to trust, to anticipate eternity, to have a hope, a hope that is undefiled, a hope that is unfading, a hope that is imperishable, a hope in the resurrection. It is a blessing to trust in God. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. I invite you to turn to Psalm 146 with me this afternoon. And as you're turning there, I'd like to share this with you. I have a problem. I have trust issues. I can't trust the things I do trust, and I trust the things I know I shouldn't trust. For example, uh, when I eat at a restaurant, I trust the kitchen staff not to defile my food by like spitting in it or leaving a hair in it or something. I trust them not to do that, and I probably shouldn't trust. I don't know. I, I, just, I just eat, and I hope that it didn't happen. I try not to think about it too much, and I just enjoy my meal. I trust. Um, and who knows what happens. <laughs> Another example. To some extent, I trust other drivers on the road uh, to obey the laws of the road and to follow the established traffic pattern. Maybe I shouldn't do that again. Uh, I was almost ran off the road today by a truck driver. Uh, that happens. Uh, people make mistakes. But I trust. I trust uh, those laws. I trust those drivers on the road. I saw on Facebook, and I agree with it, this is why I look both ways when I drive into a roundabout or a one-way street, because I don't trust you as drivers. Uh, but I I know, I know to some extent I have to. I do not trust you. I have trust issues. And it's not just me. Um, there, there are all kinds of people who have trust issues. I'm not alone. Uh, I know many people who have trust issues. For example, uh, there, there are many people who do not trust me. Uh, there's no reason for them to trust, trust me. Some of you uh, might remember what it was like to establish credibility as a young person, especially if you're a minister, establishing credibility as a young minister. I've only been in ministry for two years, and I look like I'm 15. All right, You, you know what it's like. Uh, to establish credibility. When I visit the nursing home, the sweet old ladies, they always ask me, why aren't you in school? <laughs> That's why. You know, uh, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, but I, I look like I'm 15, yeah. Uh, and as a result of my youth and my lack of experience, it's difficult to establish trust and credibility in preaching and in teaching and in other things. How do you preach a sermon uh, to parents about parenthood when you're not even a parent? How do you preach a sermon about suffering to a suffering person when you've had minimal suffering in your own life? How do you preach a sermon about marriage when you've, been, you've only been married for three years? I have found credibility to be essential, but people have trust issues. I have trust issues. Speaking of my youth, I was born in 1995, and according to sociologists, I fall, uh, my birth year falls right on the line, or at least somewhere near the line, uh, between two generations. There's lots of names, of course, for generations, but generally the millennials and what's called Gen Z, or Generation I, based on the iPhone. I fall right between them somewhere. And, and here's what I know about people my age, because I have friends that are people my age. I, I know them. Uh, here's what I know. They, they have trust issues just like I do. 
They are spiritually interested. They are interested in spiritual things. They are interested in God. Uh, they're interested in eternal life. They're even interested in salvation. They're, they're interested in morality. Uh, they're even interested in Jesus Christ. They're, they're even willing to fully commit to the gospel and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they do not trust the church. You know this. You know this is true. They are suspicious of religious institutions, especially those institutions which bear the name of Christ. Why? Because we, and by we right now, I'm, I, I mean even outside of our fellowship, we who bear the name of Christ, all those who bear the name of Christ, we are losing our credibility. If we ever had any to begin with in their eyes, our credibility fades in their eyes when our leadership commits wicked deeds. Our credibility fades when we hide that wickedness. Our credibility fades when we bet ourselves with political figures. Our credibility fades when we present ourselves as an industry of entertainment. We're a church. Remember that. Our credibility fades when our flaws and our failures are exposed. And so that's when you hear the word hypocrite thrown around because they see those flaws and those failures. It really comes down to trust issues. I have trust issues. They have trust issues. And I think you have trust issues. We have trusted in the things in which we ought not trust. We have trusted in preachers. We have trusted in politicians. We have trusted in consumerism. We have trusted in our own good works. And their credibility is lacking. You see, we have trust issues. When we trust in humanity and in the works and creations of humanity, we are assured only of one thing, inevitable destruction, whether it be through death or some other demise. There is an answer, though, to our issues of trust. There is an answer to my questions about how to preach a sermon on an issue in which you have no experience. There is an answer of how to bring the gospel to generations who are suspicious of institutional religion. There is an answer to our trust issues. And the key is where we place our trust. The key is where we place our trust. We must place our trust in God. We must place our trust in His Word. We must place our trust in His Son. We must place our trust in His Gospel. That is the not-so-secret secret I have found in establishing credibility as a young minister. I do not need to establish myself, or, or uh, I don't need to establish myself as some sort of silver-tongued devil. Um, that's not the case. That's not what I, we're called to do as Christians and ministers and preachers and teachers. We are called to proclaim Christ and Him crucified. Therefore, the gospel is not hindered by my youth, just like the gospel wasn't hindered by Paul being imprisoned. That's me personally. But this principle even applies to the larger context of the church. In order to establish credibility with these younger generations, we must resolve to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Our credibility does not come from men or the actions of men. If that were true, we would not be credible at all. We must place our trust in God. It is a blessing to trust, to have confidence and consistency, to have assurance in the unchanging. It is a blessing to trust, to rely on ever-present realities, to have certitude to have certitude and integrity. It is a blessing to trust, to depend on greater authorities, to be established in credibility. It is a blessing to trust, to anticipate eternity, to have a hope, a hope that is undefiled, a hope that is unfading, a hope that is imperishable, a hope in the resurrection. It is a blessing to trust in God. Brothers and sisters, it's, it's probably about time to address our text here. One of the key elements of the book of Psalms, when we read Psalms, is meditation. The very first psalm pronounces a blessing upon the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And in this case, meditation doesn't mean clearing one's mind, as we often use the word. It's Rather, it means to fill his or her mind with the words and the images and the subsequent emotions of the psalms, whether they be psalms of lament or praise or thanksgiving or some other kind of psalm. The reader of a psalm is first and foremost saturated 
penetrating and soaking his or her mind in the scriptures. And as a result, these psalms uh, hopefully will overflow uh, our minds and our hearts and spill into our livelihoods until every word we speak and every deed we do is punctuated by the abiding blessings of the psalms. And here in this psalm, it's the blessing of trusting in God. The final five psalms rejoice in this truth. And, and each begin with begin and they end with a call to praise the Lord, or in one word, hallelujah. The text for our lecture is the first of these final five psalms, Psalm 146. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. His plans perish. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit depart, he returns to the earth on the very day his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opened the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. The first verse serves as a call to praise the Lord. The second line, it clarifies the call by specifically stating who is receiving this call. And it's, it's one's very own soul. It's your soul. You're, you're making that call to yourself. The Hebrew word for soul in this case, you may be familiar, is nephesh. Uh, there are several examples in the Old Testament of this word invoking a physiological imagery. Um, one example of this is in one of the many cases where the Israelites are complaining and groaning in the wilderness. And they say, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. That's in Numbers 11. Here, in Numbers 11, the word is translated as whole being. But its ability to be dry bears a similar functionality uh, to the throat. Uh, another example is found in Psalm 42, where the psalmist says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God, my soul thirsts. For God, for the living God. And while the word is translated as soul, the word maintains that functionality with the throat. In the call to praise to our text, the word could be and may be used in a physiological sense, since it is definitely possible. We just did it. Uh, it's definitely possible to praise God with our throats. We just sang. We did that. However, verse 2 takes it farther. Verse 2 is a more exhaustive meaning. Verse 1 is a command to praise the Lord. Verse 2 is your response to that command. It's a personal response to that command. So the meaning of nephesh is, if not already, extended beyond just physiological language to include one's entire being. And the use of the word recalls the words of the famous the daily prayer of the Hebrews. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That prayer applies uh, the commandment to love the Lord to every aspect of a person's existence. And the same is true of the call to praise in our text in Psalm 146. The reader of the psalm responds to his or her own, her own call to praise, not only with one's voice or one's own throat, but with one's entire existence, livelihood, and being. The, these two introductory verses, these two small verses, require us to respond immediately and to interact with the psalm. It, it drags us into the psalm after we read these two psalms. And the structure of these verses places us in a posture of reflection. At, at first, when we just read, as we always read Scripture, we, we start out pretty passive when we read. Uh, maybe that's not the case with you, but that is certainly case, the case with me. The reader, though, once passive, is now invited to actively participate in the psalm. 
as one examines the present extent of their praise. To praise the Lord with one's entire being, all of one's life, implies a commitment of one's existence in every single moment of every day to the Almighty God. To call This call to praise is a call to yourself. It's a call to your very own soul at every single point in your existence. And so verses 3 and 4, after that call to praise, address these trust issues we have. The psalmist argues against placing trust in princes by revealing the, the impractical and hopeless results of such a misplaced trust. These two verses draw a stark contrast between the attributes of princes and the attributes of the Almighty God. Descriptions of such princes are offered by other texts. You, you know these. Uh, 1 Samuel refers to princes as having the throne of glory as an inheritance. Uh, Proverbs 8, the personification of wisdom, says, By me princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. So they have wisdom. But other attributes of princes, I mean, just think about a prince. They're self-evident. Uh, princes maintain a position of authority. Princes are in positions to accumulate a ton of wealth. Uh, one attribute all princes share um, it, with all humanity is just being human. Princes are human. They're mortal. Their position of authority is temporary. Their, their wealth is fleeting. And each of these princes will inevitably be removed from his throne at some point. Even the wisdom of princes is susceptible to reproach. On the other hand, in contrast, the attributes of the Lord are greater than the attributes of princes in every possible instance. Malachi makes note of the unchanging nature of the Lord in chapter 3. Psalm 90 expresses the eternal nature of the Lord when it says, Even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The psalm directly following ours speaks of God's abundant power and His immeasurable understanding. And, and when the Apostle Paul compares the wisdom of man with the wisdom of God, he concludes, The foolishness of God is wiser than men. That is why the prophet Isaiah urges us and urges mankind to stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath. Or Jeremiah, when he pronounces a curse upon those who place trust in their mankind. You see the problem? It's misplaced trust. We've placed our trust in mankind, and that is not the place where we should be trusting. The second line of verse 3, it functions in at least two ways. First, it's an immediate, in, in, in this immediate context, the line underscores the, the mortality of princes as sons of men who will ultimately meet their demise. There is no saving power in these men. There is none because salvation belongs to the Lord. And second, if you take this in the larger context of salvation history, this line functions as an echo of the language of anticipating Jesus Christ, anticipating the Messiah. The psalm warms of the follies of trusting in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. But the hope of the gospel is the opposite. The hope of the gospel is in the son of man in whom there is salvation, in a particular son of man who is the Son of God also, in whom there is salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when this larger context of, of the entire Bible, all of salvation history, is applied to verse 4, it anticipates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's waiting for the gospel. When the psalmist, son of man, breathes his last breath, his plans are over. His plans perish. In contrast, when Jesus gave up his last breath, he said, it is finished. He had completed his work. The man clothed in dazzling apparel at the tomb reminded those women, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. The Apostle Paul identifies the purpose of the sacrifice was to deliver us from this present evil age in Galatians chapter 1. And unlike the Son of Man in this psalm, the plans of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, not a Son of Man, but the Son of Man did not perish. They were not over, but were fulfilled in His death, in His burial, and His resurrection, and are still fulfilled today. This plan is our living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, as Peter says. And in response to verses 3 and 4, we, who are now participating in the psalm, have to examine ourselves and where we place our trust. It urges us to, to abandon confidence in any sort of temporary existence, knowing that all those things Things fade away. 
and it stirs up a conflict in us which requires a resolution. The conflict here is just the simple truth of all of, our, all of us, every human's, every mortal being's imminent demise. The reader is left, you and I are left with a longing for something or someone beyond the limitations of mortal existence, someone transcendent of time, someone, someone greater than, than even temporary existence. This is where verse 5 comes in. In verse 5, the psalmist pronounces a blessing on those who, whose help is in the God of Jacob. The word happy may also be translated as blessed or blessed. This is the same word David used in Psalm 32 when he pronounced a blessing on the forgiven. This was the same word in Psalm 65 uh, uses to describe a person who is chosen by God to dwell in the temple. This word is used by biblical writers to, to communicate the essence of the ideal life of a faithful servant in the Lord. It's the good life in God's eyes. In this case, the ideal life is the the life of the person who finds help in God, specifically the God of Jacob. The word help here is the same word that, which was used by the Lord God in Genesis 2 when he said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. The word is also uh, the same foundation of the name Eliezer, at whose birth was said, the God of my father was my help. Psalm 115 identifies the Lord as their help and their shield. Thus, the biblical use of the word help conveys concepts of companionship and deliverance and protection. This, at this moment, is the second time the psalmist has switched from using the divine name to a divine title. The first time was in verse 2, um, when, when the psalmist identified the Lord with the, the, the title of divinity. The psalmist worships uh, Yahweh. Here, the divine title is linked to Jacob. Lincoln Jacob recalls Jacob's own quest for blessings in the book of Genesis. First, in acquiring that blessing of the birthright from his brother. Second, in the dream of God uh, blessing him at Bethel. And, and third, the blessings uh, immediately following his wrestling and his striving in, in chapter 32. And after these quests for blessings, Jacob blesses his brother and he says it's because God has dealt graciously with me in Genesis 33. The blessing of help that the psalm uh, describes is similar to the Lord's gracious dealing with Jacob. The ideal life, the, the good life, according to God, according to the psalmist, is the life in which the Lord deals graciously with us. That is a good life. The second line of verse 5 carries on this same blessing to a person whose hope is in the Lord God. The only other use of this word occurs in uh, Psalm 119, where the psalmist places his or her hope in the Word of God. The blessing of hope is an anticipation of the Lord's eternal reign. The psalmist reaffirms the identification of the Lord as his own God. You notice this in the second line of verse 5. Uh, verses 6 and 7, they set forth a description of this God. These descriptions are the foundation of the blessings of help and hope. Uh, the, the first line of verse 6 identifies this God as the same God who created heaven and earth. It recalls Genesis chapter 1, which uses that divine title throughout the first chapter, and then rather than the divine name, which is, which is first used in Genesis 2. Uh, the identification of God as creator reaffirms that truth of the blessing by, by acknowledging the transcendence and the power of God. The attribute of God as creator places our help and our hope on something which is independent of anything in all creation and transcendent of anything in all creation. This allows our help and our hope to be truly objective. Because there's nothing in this world that can diminish that source of help and hope. And there's nothing in existence that is more powerful than the source of our blessing. The second line of verse 6 makes mention of the Lord of the sea and all that's in them. This imagery is all over the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. Uh, the imagery of the sea and, and, and things in the sea has deep roots in Scripture. Uh, the first place you see this is the imagery in the creation account in Genesis 1 verse 2, which says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. 
And the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering over the face of the waters. This imagery is revisited in the flood narrative. When God pours his wrath out upon the wickedness of mankind, the imagery of, of these chaotic waters is used again in the narrative of the crossing of the Red Sea, where in Exodus chapter 15, the people of Israel, they sing, And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. There are several psalms which use this imagery. Um, Psalm 69 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters and the floods overflow me. Psalm 124 uses the same imagery of chaotic waters, uh, of being swallowed up in those waters, and, and the streams without the Lord. Isaiah 17, the prophet, describes the nations as the rushing of many waters. In Amos 5.24, the prophet describes the justice of God as water, and the righteousness of God as a mighty stream. And in the midst of a raging tempest, Jonah is hurled into the sea, and he prays, You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surround me. All your billows and your waves pass over me. Many of these images uh, communicate themes of chaos and darkness in the waters. But in each and every circumstance that, that I just shared with you, and I'm sure even more uh, than what I've shared with you, in each of those circumstances... They are chaotic waters. They, they, are, um, they, are, they are, do have darkness in them. But God is in control in all of those circumstances. God is always in control of the waters. The source of our help and our hope is the one who even controls those chaotic and dark waters. This concept is similar to what the Apostle Paul expressed in, in Romans 8, 38 and 39. It's the same idea here. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The truth spoken of in verse 6 is an objective truth. The use of the word forever suggests this truth is established as a timeless principle. This truth is being kept by the Lord, implies that it is above and beyond even human existence. It transcends all creation. It is a reliable and a faithful witness to the events of human history. This truth becomes a help and a hope to the person participating in the psalm because it establishes the existence of an imperishable witness to the deeds of mankind. This witness is God, the Almighty God, a, a personal being who not only views the events, he, he sees them, he views the events of human history, but he also intervenes in these events. He doesn't just watch it happen, he responds to it. In response to verses 5 and 6, when we are reading uh, the psalm, when we are participating in the psalm, we must examine our source of help and hope. Where, where verses 3 and 4, they removed any, any mortal being as a possible candidate for our source of blessing. Verses 5 and 6 give us the substitute here. They, it, it establishes us in the ideal candidate, the God of Jacob. And the reader must now consider the attributes of the Lord and test those attributes against any other source of hope. In every case, though, in every case, this test results in the Lord being our imperishable hope. This brings us to verses 7 through 9. These, these are a collection of several ways through which the Lord intervenes in the events of human history. There are nine of these. Uh, by the way, you've got the book. You can read all you want to about these nine in the book. I'm going to be pretty short about this one, all right, about these nine. We'll summarize really well. Um, there are nine instances of divine intervention here. God intervenes for the oppressed by executing justice. God intervenes for the hungry with the provision of nutrition. God intervenes for the prisoners by bringing liberation and deliverance. God intervenes for the blind with a miraculous change in perspective. God intervenes for the lowly with an exaltation. God intervenes for the righteous with an outpouring of love. God intervenes for the strangers by offering a watchful protection. God intervenes for the fatherless and the widows with support and provision. 
intervention. These interventions of God provide hope and help in the reliable witness of God and in his response to the events of, of history. He is not only a witness of these events, but he acts. He responds to these events with hope and hope. The hope of the oppressed is the reliable witness of God and his response to those immortal actions. The hope of the hungry is the blessing of nutrition. The hope of the imprisoned is a deliverance by the mighty hand and the strong arm of God. The hope for the blind is an opening of of eyes. The hope of the humble is God's graceful authority. The hope of the righteous is an approval of a wholesome livelihood. The hope of the sojourner is a watchful protection. The hope of the widow and the orphan is the provision of God. But the ninth is, a different, is different from the other eight. The ninth of these interventions is a reversal. It's turning something upside down. The, the previous eight interventions have illustrated the blessing God gives to those who trust in Him. And He does. The ninth is the opposite. The path of the wicked is turned upside down, reflecting their crooked behavior. For the wicked, there is no hope. The only expectation they have, the only thing they can look forward to, are the consequences of their own choices. The consequences of the path they have led themselves down. This is a reminder of the first psalm. The way of the wicked will perish. The hope for the person who walks in the way of the Lord, on the other hand, the hope for them is the Lord confronting wickedness and bringing their iniquities upon them. The structure of these nine interventions serve as what some preachers call, I don't know, if it depends on who you're talking to, I guess, a run. That's when you uh, list off uh, the same words over and over again with different things at the end of them. Uh, that's, what, that's what he's doing here. The repetition of the divine name. Uh, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. With a divine action specific to each group of people. It, it builds emotion and it anticipates that final statement in the psalm, God's reign. The Lord's eternal reign in verse 10 contrast with those temporary plans of princes in verses 3 and 4. And because of God's eternal blessing of verse 5, it's, it's extended to all generations. The blessing of hope and help for those who trust in the Lord is a timeless principle. That means that blessing is not just a blessing for the people in the day of the psalmist. It's a blessing for me and you that we can trust in God. We have that ability to do so. Jesus Christ proclaimed the coming of such a hope. When hundreds of years after the writing of this psalm in a synagogue in the town of Nazareth, he would unroll that scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he'd read these words concerning himself. He would, he would read this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's in Luke 4, 18 and 19. The call to praise is repeated again at the end of the psalm. An affirmation of the blessing of serving the Lord God Almighty who provides, protects, and blesses those who trust Him and whose kingdom reigns forever and ever. Hallelujah. It is a blessing to trust, to have confidence and consistency, to have assurance in the unchanging. It is a blessing to trust, to rely on ever-present realities, to have certitude in integrity. It is a blessing to trust, to depend on greater authorities, to be established in credibility. It is a blessing to trust, to anticipate eternity, to have a hope, a hope that is undefiled, a hope that is unfading, a hope that is imperishable, a hope in in the resurrection. It is a blessing to trust in God. Brothers and sisters and friends, we need to put our trust in God. We need to start doing that. We need to put our trust in God in all of our everyday lives. We need to be able to worship Him with, with, with all of our livelihood, with all of our existence, so that our soul, our entire being, is magnifying God. Maybe this afternoon it is time for you to place your trust in God. Maybe this afternoon it's time for you to place your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to follow in His footsteps of death, burial, and resurrection in the moment of baptism uh, for, for the salvation of 
uh, of you and for the remission of your sins. Maybe this time, maybe this afternoon, this is the time for you to place your trust in God. If there's any way we can help you, please come while we stand and while we sing.